Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Phil, and thank you, Ryan, for um, for having me. I'm uh, super grateful to to be here and to be back as well. I remember last year it was kind of a highlight of my year uh, throughout anything that I did. So uh, yeah, as soon as the CFP came out for this year, I was like, I'm definitely coming back. So I, I I streamlined my whole year and research into making sure I had something for this conference. And I'm not going to be referencing too much what I did last year, but certainly we're going to be kind of touching a little bit upon where I left off last year and how where we are now in terms of the ransomware as a service space so if we can go on to the next slide i'll just do a very brief introduction so my name is jono um i've been the pwc threat intel team for almost god three years now or just over three years um technical analyst um i the only fun fact that, that's worth mentioning about me right now is uh, i love love metal music um the only reason that's relevant is because i'm actually just missing pantera <laughs> i'm missing pantera right now to give this talk which i'm fine with i'm so okay with i'm i'm here for it um, but I will be dashing off a little bit quickly after this talk just to make sure I get back to you, Gajira. Um, in terms of who I work for, God, I'm so honored to be representing the PwC Threat Intel team. It's kind of, in my opinion, PwC's best kept secret. Um, we have Threat Intel analysts, some of whom I will be kind of giving homage to in the next slide, um, over, over technical and strategic reporting, doing both forecasting of why cyber events happen, but also how the malware works and what we're seeing in terms of you know, malware communicating with its C2, but also from an underlying code base perspective. So if you can go just click the next bit, unless I have, yeah, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a ransomware as a service uh, or a recipe for disaster. I think I have control now. It wouldn't be a recipe for disaster without looking at the perspective or from the perspective of the kitchen. So I'm very grateful to be giving this talk uh, with research done by so many members of the Threat Intel team. And there's, there's three of them on this screen um, who are all, all in their own right, great chefs uh, in the context of this of this talk, um, if I if I think about this is an American audience, so if I think about the team not as being full of Jamie Oliver's or uh, um, of Gordon Ramsay's, but of of Guy Fieri's, this uh, this Threat Intel team is uh, well riding with this Threat Intel team is like a, a one way ticket to Flavor Town. If anyone actually gets that reference, um, but Andy has been so instrumental in in doing kind of the dark web stuff for me and helping me kind of work out the relationship between affiliates and operators as they as they kind of work their way um through communication with each other over the dark web jack simpson uh, also link cabin on youtube has some really great resources for people just starting out with reverse engineering on on how to get started and he's pretty much taught me everything i know so shout out to jack and also for his work on the black fight ransomware which i would not have been able to do without him um and adam prescott and adam is is just adam and an incredible static analysis uh reverse engineer knows everything about everything um, and has also been instrumental in looking at the black the black cat research that, that is going to be in this presentation so without without any of these people this talk really wouldn't be what it is so very grateful for the pwc threat intel team and especially these members in particular so next slide uh, and then the next slide after that in terms of how i wanted to present this talk i i i want to tell a story as i always do when i give a conference talk like i, I give them every year uh, but particularly with, with this conversation, there's so much to talk about and so little time. And one of the things I'm really grateful for in terms of the Ransomware Summit or the SANS Ransomware Summit is there are there have been so many great talks before mine and there will be so many great talks after mine, all of which contribute to me having to say fewer words. Um, Alan, uh, the keynote speaker, is going to be covering or has covered a lot of what I was going to say in the overview of the 2023 RAS environment. Um, the Trend Micro guys, the DFIR guys, uh, the CrowdStrike as well, those talks all focusing on kind of the affiliate techniques, that's going to cover a lot of what we're going to be talking about at the end of the talk. So I'm, I'm actually probably just going to leave some slides, not blank, but I'm probably not going to voice them over all that much because there are so many great resources um, available that have either already gone or are coming up. And, and Noel from Northwave is going to give a really, really great talk on kind of deep diving Lockbit. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Lockbit, but not all that much because I just don't need to. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, um, what I'm going to be talking about is the consolidated players looking at Lockbit, uh, Black Cat, uh, and Clop, looking at how their code bases work and how they've changed over time. And then some of the newer players as well. So Basta Royal, Akira, and uh, even a small touch on Bien Lien as well, just to get like a really good overview of, of these different ransomware as a service operations. And when I think about who this talk is for, uh, the, the IR guys do their IR thing, okay? I'm, I don't have the power to to talk about uh, specific processes and and the good detection techniques that you could use for looking at specific processes i am by by trade a reverse engineer so what i'm interested in 
is looking at code base from a from an assembly level, how the changes are made and what that means, because just looking at ransomware code base is pretty, uh, I don't know, it, it doesn't really add much, but understanding where the changes are and why they happen and kind of giving some forecasting or voiceover as to why that is, is kind of where I want this talk to go. And in doing that, we're able to not just open this talk up in usefulness to the reverse engineers, and I will be providing some tips and tricks as to where to look for detection content or uh, Yara content, I would say, for reverse engineers, but also from a more C-suite perspective, looking at why does this ransomware change matter to me if I'm talking to a client or I'm talking to my C-suite or my board from an advisory perspective, why does that matter? And what do I have to offer? Well, hopefully you'll be able to offer something after this talk. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just gonna be uh, offering up some, uh, some small caveats of where we left off from last year. So if we go to the next slide and then click again. I was very fortunate enough to give this talk last year um, and I don't wanna to talk too much about last year. If we click again and then click again, where we left off was the Black Cat ransomware had just started out. And from, from PwC perspective, we assessed it highly likely that the Black Cat ransomware had emanated out of the Black Matter ransomware. And I will take this opportunity to give a shout out to Orange Cyber Defense. Um, and I just cannot remember the name of the analyst who made the graph, but there is this incredible graph of all of the ransomware code bases and how they all link to each other. Really worth checking out. I think I've seen it on the like one of the Slack channels. It's excellent. And I know how long it took to make and I feel the pain. So. Well done to Orange Cyber Defense, it's excellent. Conti had dissolved and we were wondering about Basta and, and Royal as to what they would be doing, how their, how their RAS uh, and operations would develop over time. And we now have the fruits of that and we will be talking about that in a little bit. And then next slide, or rather click again. The last thing to take away from last year's talk, which I will be bringing back into this year's talk is the most important thing you need to think about with ransomware as a service from my perspective is that ransomware is a business. Yes, it's terrible. And yes, uh, Jake gave some, I think it was Jake, someone gave some really great pointers as to Vice Society specifically targeting education and healthcare sectors, which is a big no-no, that sucks. But if I ignore all the bad things in my brain and I just think about ransomware for what it is, then it is a business. It's a business that relies on a software, i.e. the encryption tool, to attract affiliates and make that encryption tool as accessible as possible, because the more accessible it is, the more people are going to use it. It's, it's just similar to any software. And so from that perspective, that's how I think about ransomware when I, when I reverse it, because that's what I'm taking to clients. That's what I'm writing in my reports. Yeah, it's an encryption tool it's kind of boring because uh, it's going to encrypt stuff, but the individual choices that these individual operators make in their ransomware is, is what separates each of the uh, operations from, from each other. So going on to the next slide, I really don't have to talk all that much about this slide, which is excellent. Uh, if we click again and then can I, yeah, click again and then click one more time. Alan has already talked about this and I really don't feel the need to uh, to bring this up all that much, but I will just like briefly voice over. Yeah, the leak site numbers are up. It, it's worse than it was uh, from last year. And we don't know everything about the numbers because we don't know from a global perspective, the percentage of how many people pay versus how many people end up on the leak site. We don't know the, the, the percentage on that. And there are some articles out there, but I would caution all of them or caution kind of using those as gospel. Uh, we have ransomware service operations that were startups when I gave this talk last year and now have become more consolidated. Black Cat is one of those examples, and I'll be talking about that in quite a lot of detail. Black Byte as well has become an incredibly sophisticated ransomware as a service operation with an incredibly sophisticated binary. And again, shout out to Jack Simpson for doing pretty much all the work on that. I, I can't really take any of the credit for, for reversing that without his help. And then the the whole environment has changed. The war in Ukraine has done a lot to, to change the ransomware as a service environment. Um, and I can't speak too much about this because I don't have the time and Alan has done a really good job of summarizing the whole environment as to where we are this year in 2023. But certainly the, the war in Ukraine, the geopolitics of, of the wider, well, the wider geopolitics of, of where we are impacts the ransomware as a service environment and no cyber event exists in a vacuum. I think that's a really key takeaway. And it's likely that as geopolitics across the world continues, 
as it always does, we like to see changes in the ransomware as a service environment too. And I'll touch upon that a little bit with Akira in just a little bit, because there's a really spicy detail that came out over the last 24 hours, which is definitely worth touching upon. So if we go to the next slide, uh, yep, and we just go on to the next slide. Um, so let's just click through a few of these. I'm going to be I'm going to be talking about each of these operations from a if we click to the next next two uh, from a ransomware code base and also an overview overall operational perspective. And the reason I'm doing that, as I kind of mentioned, is because I don't want this to just be a talk about code base, because I feel like there is more to say. If I click to the next slide as well, or not the next slide, the next thing. We've spoken about victim numbers already. There is nuance there. We don't see everything, and it will come out. It will come up on a caveat in the next, in one of the next bullet points. But this is the bottom line up front. This is what I want the takeaway to be. And if you want to stop listening now, go ahead. As long as you listen to this bullet point, the ransomware as a service environment. If you look at all of the operations, the key ones anyway, there's evolution there. The evolution isn't isn't uniform. We see different operations favoring different things and different techniques. But across the board, they've all found a way to improve their service, improve the number of victims they have, or just generally improve their TTPs and the streamlining of their operations. And that's that's really significant because we I think we take for granted sometimes that these operators and operations are 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 individuals who who make choices every day. They sit around a table on their Zoom calls or whatever and discuss what they're going to change about things. And that's we see with the interactions with affiliates. They communicate with their customers. They are readily asking for things that are different. They they get rid of affiliates when they're not doing their job or they're causing controversy or impacting their business. There are there are evolutions across all the board, and we'll see that in each of the ransomware service operations that we're going to be looking at. So if we go on to the next little bit, there are a few caveats. Uh, click two more, please. Each region will have different patterns. And I spoke to Phil before this conference, just when we were going through slides. He was seeing a ransomware that I'd actually never seen on an instant response engagement before. And that was that was really interesting because I've seen some ransomware that he hadn't seen on an instant response engagement. We all see different slices of the big global pie. And I think drawing global conclusions is really hard, especially when we look at instant response data, because it's it's just a slice of a, a window of a whole house with lots of windows, whatever the anecdote or whatever the uh, metaphor is. And, and it's all about affiliate TTPs. And I will. Hark on this again, this summit is amazing because I do not have the time nor the ability really to give you like key details in affiliate TTPs, but you've just had three talks preceding mine, all of which were about affiliate TTPs, whether it be on ESXi environments, whether it be on Windows environments, different affiliates using different techniques, whether they be bespoke techniques, bespoke tools, or just commodity tools. And again, shout out to everyone who has already given a talk because they are all just excellent and I just feel terrible having to go after them. I wish I could be a keynote next year so I don't have to worry about who I'm comparing myself to. But let's begin. So I think we are starting with Lockbit. If I, someone goes on to the next slide, if possible. Yes, okay, and click again. The way that this is gonna work is I'm gonna have like a left-hand bar which has kind of raw data from uh, leak sites and, and um, PwC's observations. Uh, the map, is is not going to change all that much between the uh, between the affiliate pro, uh, pre, between the operations, and that's just because uh, targeting is kind of uniform in terms of there is a really good talk somewhere about the geopolitics of ransomware, and I don't have the time and again nor ability to give it, but you will see the U.S. and Canada and Northern and Western Europe and Australia and India come up again, and I will say as a bit of nuance to this map. India, when, I, when I've seen anecdotally India targeted, it's usually a Western company that has a data center or some form of um, outsourcing there. So it tends to be that kind of targeting, if that makes sense. And if we now talk about Lockbit a little bit, and I only have to talk about it a little bit because there is a talk after mine by Noel from Northwave, who is doing like a deep dive into Lockbit. So if you click once and then click again. Uh, Lockbit is a really excellent starting point because as Alan has already alluded to, it's one of those, it is the ransomware. It's it's the ransomware that even your mum knows about. It's just, it's so prevalent. And if we see the number of victims, 474 across 2023, if I compare that to Black Cat, which is the next one under, I think it's 170, and then Black Basta, which is 101, and Royal, which is something like 110. I really hope that's correct, and we'll find out how wrong I am on the next slides to come. But it's just it's just incredible. But for an entity that doesn't even use its own code base, like Lockbit Black is 
a is a carbon copy of black matter and there are rumors that black uh, that black matter or a black matter developer and lockbit did some dealings for a, for, a, for an entity that doesn't use its own code base it's pretty incredible to see the number of victims they have and if we click the next two that says to me that lockbit is an entity that is how do i say this uh, lockbit is an entity that focuses a lot more on affiliate management. If you imagine how difficult it is to process 474 victims across a year, very, very difficult. So to me, Lockbit is an entity that has a lot more resources or percentage resources in, in negotiations, in staff to help that, to make sure that uh, the decryption keys are handed out, that the affiliates are managed correctly because there must be a, a, a whole bunch of them and that the victims are processed correctly and properly because that's management in of itself. So that's a really uh, that's a really interesting takeaway. And as I said, Noel is going to do a bigger deep dive on Lockbit, the Lockbit code base. But I will say just as a small little reverse engineering tip, if you wanted a, a little like Yara rule, I'd really recommend looking at the language check uh, of the Black Matter code base because it's the same as it was in Darkside. There is a very there are two very specific language checks or keyboard checks that it makes. That I have never seen outside of 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 Dark Side back when Dark Side was a thing back in 2020. Um, so I'd recommend maybe looking at that and signaturing that. On to the next ransomware service, which is Black Cat, which is uh, I have a bit of a soft spot for Black Cat. So if there's any if there are any Black Cat uh, developers or affiliates online watching this talk, uh, you guys are excellent. Love your work. If we click on the next thing, you'll have the the thing on the next. Oh, 170. I was correct. I've given Black Cat a Michelin star of, uh, of, of three stars. And the reason I've done that is because if we click uh, two more times, um, the reason I've done that is because the Black Cat code base has undergone such substantial changes. And I'm going to bring in some Black Byte anecdotal evidence as well, or rather some of the research we've done with Black Byte. Black Byte and Black Cat are these two really sophisticated malwares, just from a code base perspective. If you look at the left-hand side, which is something I actually stole from my previous talk last year, the Black Cat code base, the version 1.0 was like a mess. It was almost underdeveloped. There, was, there was ne wasn't nearly as many uh, code, code base obfuscation techniques as there are now. There is now a, a past, like a, a token that you need in order to access the, the binary. So we're, we're now to give some perspective, we're in Black Cat 5.0. And this is taken from Black Cat 1.0, but is also relevant to 2.0. 3.0 and 4.0, which is called Morph, and 5.0, which is called Sphinx, have undergone some incredible changes. And Black Byte, um, yeah, Black Byte is the same. Black Byte went from being a Go-based malware to a C++ malware with just a hell of a load of anti-analysis techniques. To give some perspective, the Black Byte malware requires a token, but before you even get to the token, there are two anti-analysis techniques that prevent you from even entering it if, if the malware uh, confirms that you are debugging it in, in a debugged environment. So, and then I think about why is that? What is that for? It's not for me, because by the time I get to the ransomware, nobody, like the, the, the threat actor doesn't care because the ransomware has already been detonated, the encryption's already been done, and there's not really much from a, from a detection perspective or not much I can offer for, for an IR team or a victim in need from a code base perspective. I can tell them how the threat actor did it and wow, how efficient the encryption mechanism is, but I think that's just going to make them sad. So the obfuscation isn't for me, except for the challenge. The obfuscation is a business decision, and we'll see from more the more the more developing operations like Akira and Black Basta and um, and Royal, they've taken the Conti code base and just run with it because it works. It's really effective. Actually, where the 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 bread and butter is, the where the money is for them is in making sure they get initial access correct, the lateral movement, and the uh, credential access and the discovery phase is correct, and all of those things those can be readily found or, or rather solutions for those can be readily found in the previous talks, which I will mention again from Trend Micro, from CrowdStrike and from the DFIR guys. Oh, just excellent talks. I'm, I'm so hyped to be here. These, these business decisions are anti-analysis techniques, not for me, but for other RAS entities to prevent other entities from stealing their code base, preventing them from finding the most efficient encryption mechanisms, preventing them from advertising on the dark web to affiliates things that they readily do in a unique way. And if I think again about a business, it's like trademark and copywriting, but from an, from a, from an operation perspective, from, from an illegal entity, it prevents 
uh, lockbit from stealing their code base or prevents them from taking ideas. And the Black Cat malware is really excellent. It has some really unique implementations of, uh, how do I say this? Some really unique encryption implementations to speed it up, which I, I was fascinated by when I first looked at it. And Adam has done, as I said, Adam Prescott has done a really good job of doing, of finding that out in the newer variants of Black Cat 2. So again, let's cycle through some of these bullet points and let's move on to my second favorite ransomware, which is CLOP. Um, and one more. And one more. So CLOP and one more. <laughs> and probably one more. Excellent. CLOP, by the way, if no, I didn't know this, CLOP still has like an, an encryption tool. And the reason I say I didn't know that is because they've had so much success this year with their research and development into zero days both the go anywhere and then the move it vulnerability this month. And yes, I know PwC is on the leaks. Like you don't have to tell me I'm aware we're dealing with it. Okay. They they've pushed so many resources in, is into R and D that they've actually just not seemed to have used their encryption tools, but they do have an XE both in 32 and 64 bit, as well as an L variant, both of which are worth looking at just from a reverse engineering perspective. They're kind of interesting. They're not all that sophisticated and there has not been that much change in the way the code base has functioned which similar to when I think about Lockbit and Blackbyte and Black Cat, why does this matter? Well, it's clear they have, they have found innumerable success and it says 106 victims. It's way more than that now, just thanks to the move it vulnerability. The, the resources have from CLOP, they have decided to push those resources more currently into research and development into zero days. And if we click two more times, um, that is not the whole story. And I think it's really important to emphasize that there's a real knee jerk reaction to say, okay, well, Klopp is one of those, it has now moved away from encryption entirely, like a Bien Lien, which we are going to talk about, where they've moved away from encryption. They're now just purely focusing on data extortion. Not true. And I say not true because there are about five or six or seven victims that are on the Klopp leak site that have been encrypted, that are not related to zero days. They are just sporadic victims. Of, of an encryption kind of uh, of an in encryption based intrusion. CLOP, like every ransomware as a service operation, is opportunistic. Where they find success, they will continue to operate. And the one thing that keeps the lights on in these businesses, as the same with every business, is the ability to generate revenue. And I think that's that's extremely important to remember. And um, important to bear in mind from a reverse engineer perspective that just because the ransomware is basic and just because it isn't used that much, you are gonna be such an asset to your team if you just spend the time reversing it, taking the time to understand how it works and how it functions. Because when the time comes and you end up seeing a clock ransomware because it's being used because they don't have the resources to, or they don't have, they haven't found a new, a new uh, exploit to, to leverage. And so they need to keep generating revenue. You're gonna be an asset to your team. So I would always say, if it's there, reverse it. Um, so let's move on to, I would think we're on the newer players now, which is excellent because I think we're just about on time. Thanks to the DFR guys, Trend Micro and to, to CrowdStrike because I'm going to, there's going to be a, like an affiliate slide that I'm just not going to really talk to because I won't need to because all the information has been said in greater detail than I ever could. So if we move on to the newer players onto the next slide and then one more and then one more and then one more, <laughs> let's do two more. Yeah. So Black Blackbuster is really interesting and, and also one of my favorites. I have a real soft spot for for Black Buster. And again, I know I sound like a sycophant and a rubbernecker because I love the code bases, but Black Buster like 1.0 didn't work. Uh, you're seeing on here on the screen, the, the Black Buster 1.0 just didn't encrypt subfolders. It had a, a fault in its, in its encryption where if you had a folder within a folder, the ransomware would drop the readme and then it would just not encrypt. And I, I, I kind of laughed about it, but uh, let's click again. They have since made improvements to their code base and there is evidence to suggest that they are actually testing binaries as they go. Um, and someone was kind enough to upload a leaked version or rather a testing build of what looked like a test build of the Black Buster 2.0 if we click one more. The, the Buster code base has some sophistication. There is elements where they've cleaned up the code base. So what you're seeing there on the right hand side is like a really cleaned version of their code base. 1.0 was all over the place. Um, and there is a newer version, which I've seen this month, which has obfuscation. It actually doesn't look this neat anymore. And I said, oh, come on, guys, really? But they've that it shows that they're thinking about code base as an important part of their operation. And 
including things like encryption percent, which wasn't there originally, or making sure it functions correctly. And by the way, encryption percent is something that was in the original Conti. Uh, it's also in Akira as well, but implemented slightly differently. Um, we are seeing all these newer players toy with the notion of their of their code base to make sure it's as appropriate for affiliates as possible. And that's really interesting because it's clear that Basta, as Akira have done as well, are really thinking about their affiliates and how their affiliates can use their code base or their software for their intrusions. If we go on to the next slide, Royal is kind of like the anomaly in the newer players. And one more, and maybe one more, I think one more. Yeah, Con it's just a Conti ripoff. But unlike Basta, the code base just hasn't really changed all that much. Like there is some weird differences in the way the functions have been moved around, but for the most part, the functionality is exactly the same. But the difference is just that if we click one more, Royal has had like a heavy focus on initial access recently. Uh, we've seen the sophistication in phishing emails in particular increase dramatically. And that includes in, including a legitimate hotline for victims to call to check that their post had been delivered or that the email that, that was sent is in fact legitimate. And I think that's really fun because it shows a ransomware operation saying, okay, where are we finding success and where do we not care? Because we don't have unlimited resources like me. I have unlimited resources to give a talk three hours long about uh, affiliates and their DFIR stuff and, and all of the instant response case studies that I've seen. And thank God, as I've said a million times, for all the guys that came before me and the people that are coming after me. These entities, Royal in particular, is looking at their situation and saying, okay, we don't have limit, unlimited resources. Where are we finding success? Initial access, right? Well, let's focus on that. The code base is working. Once we have initial access, we're finding that we are more often than not completing or fight or you know carrying out our access or our intrusion to completion and that's why they weirdly have despite no code base changes more more victims on leak sites than bass to do which I, I find really incredible i still give them two stars because selfishly i don't rate the code base and i don't rate their operation but sorry if there are any royal affiliates or royal developers i'm really sorry step up your game guys next slide we're going to move on to akira and akira is really interesting because it's really new and yeah, it's a Conti ripoff. Uh, let's click a couple more. Uh, it's really new, um, but, uh, and by the way, this, this function here, it's not gonna be all that helpful to most people. This is uh, the decryption routine that it uses to decrypt the string for the delete vo shadow volume copies. I'll give you a little tip. If you look at the binary from a static analysis perspective, you'll see three functions in a row. One of them's like an enumerate, one of them is uh, uh, making sure the akira.txt file is loaded. And the, and the third one is this function here, signature this function, because this decryption routine is, is not just in Akira, but it's in, in Conti as well. So they really have just kind of ripped the code base off kind of word for word. Um, next next bullet point. One of the really interesting thing about code base, the code base is there are some changes already. And it's, it's not an old operation. They've had, I think now, God, I think they're up to 45 victims from my count on, on leak sites since the uh, since their initial kind of drop in April 23. That's an incredible number. Like the pace of operations is incredible. And we're seeing now, I don't have time to fully talk about it, but there is some, there is some clear uh, affiliate mismanagement where the operator is having some uh, negotiation problems or rather some uh, problems with their affiliates targeting people they don't want them to target. And there was a South Africa-based victim that was, by all accounts, the perfect target. It is a uh, it is an, uh, a financial services-based victim for a country that other victims, uh, that other operations have targeted in the past. And the operator came out and said, look, there's nothing to do with us. Really sorry, we'll help the entity recover all their files, et cetera, et cetera. And I find that really interesting because for a perfect target, why are you not targeting it? And I said, I don't have the time nor the ability to talk about it, but I really hope someone does a conference talk on the geopolitics of ransomware at some point, because the Akira ransomware is such an interesting and new thing for us to look at. And I expect we will be talking about Akira this time next year as one of the big players. That's just my, my, my personal prediction. PwC is not affiliated with my thoughts or opinions. On to the next slide. I'm going to briefly touch on Bien Lien, which is one of my, again, such a funny, funny ransomware to deal with because it's not really a ransomware anymore. Like there just isn't a code base. Uh, if we click on uh, the next one, Bien Lien has decided for whatever reason, that it's dropping its code base and has found more success in its uh, in its ability to compromise victims via initial access and then um, exfiltrate, exfiltrate data and then contact the victim via email or WhatsApp. 
uh, I was lucky enough to be privy to a, a Blian the Enran uh, incident where they initial accessed via, uh, I think, legit credentials, uh, used commodity tools like Mimikat and PowerShell Empire, took everything they needed and then sent the, the victim an email, which is not funny, by the way, I don't find it funny, but just comparing it to all the, the operations that come before. And then thinking about the success that they've had, it's incredible, 47 victims, I think it's more than that now, in 2023 alone, for an entity that started in 22 with like a random, quite limited Golang backdoor and a Golang ransomware encryption tool, they've decided to, found, to find the most success in their ability to just red team effectively. It's, it's really interesting. And I, it's, uh, it, I expect them to also be an entity that we're still talking about, which is why I gave them two and a half stars. On to the next slides, and this is going to be annoying for anyone clicking for me, is there, it's going to be quite a few things to click through. Let's just click all the way through to the next slide. So just click through all of these. We all know the dark web exists and the conversations between, between operators and affiliates is, is, so, uh, is so prevalent. And it's one of those things that I have to thank Andy Ord for, for helping me find these conversations and helping me understand them because I don't speak Russian, sadly. But we see the marketplace that these operators run in um, and it's alive with chatter, with advertisements, with different deals and offers. And if I think about what's the most important thing about compromises from a threat hunt perspective, it's TTPs, it's affiliate TTPs. And if we go on to the next slide and just click all the way through it, if I think about the most important parts of the affiliate kind of intrusion from start to finish, I think initial access, I think defense evasion, I think discovery, and then I think exfiltration. There is nothing on this slide except for one little detail that hasn't been said already. So I actually think I'm kind of okay to just say, this slide is best done red, and then go and visit the previous talks by Trend Micro, by CrowdStrike, by DFIR, to go look at like in depth the, the cool things that they're seeing from an IR perspective and the cool things you can do as a defender to highlight or rather to begin to protect yourself against ransomware. The one thing I will add is that because of the initial access things we're seeing, there are easy things we can do as defenders from a, from a um, what's the word I'm looking for? From an operational perspective to protect against these things, including MFA and accounts, uh, introducing cyber hygiene into a professional environment, i.e. not allowing employees to use professional credentials for personal items and the reuse of passwords or uh, teaming up with a password vault, for example, to provide enterprise passwords, uh, password vaults for everyone. And then finally, I just wanted to say, Exfiltration is actually a really interesting point, just from a reverse engineer and, and malware analyst perspective. There is a way to be able to signature the way in which these very bespoke um, exfiltration tools, I'm talking Steelbit, Xmatter, Xbyte for, from X, from uh, Blackbyte, and there are some bespoke scripts as well used by Vice Society and others. If you are able to understand how those, um, how those entities and how those scripts exfiltrate and the speed at which they do it, if you can capture those network, if you can capture the uh, exfiltration happening on the network in real time, you can prevent, potentially prevent the encryption from taking place. And I've seen this happen in real time on instant response engagements where it's been possible to alert the victim or as the victim to, to be alerted to the exfiltration taking place and then shutting down servers and preventing the encryption from happening because it's, it's likely that the encryption won't take place until the entire exfiltration has been conducted. With that, I can't believe I made that in time. I, I can now go on to my last slide, which is just key takeaways. And we can just cycle through all of them until we get to the end of the slide. Um, the bottom line up front, as I said, the ransomware service environment is not stagnant. It is dynamic. And we need to think about it as such. And this time next year, I am so sure we're going to be talking about it from a different perspective as well. You know, ransomware from a low level perspective is useful, but there are elements that are perfectly defendable. And again, I'm going to say it for the 15th millionth time, the talks before me and the talks after me have some excellent points as to how to do that and how to begin negotiating that with your enterprise. And then finally, there are some elements of the ransomware service game which are a little bit more complex than they were last year. And the the uh, the cre or the advent of, of zero days is fairly troubling, I would say, as a key takeaway and something to take away as, as a discussion point. We're not just seeing it with Klopp. Uh, we've seen even with Nokayawa ransomware, like their affiliates are also making use of zero days. Affiliates from Black Cat and Lockbit are making use of zero days to intrude on victims. It's a fairly, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but the last thing I would say, it's we are seeing a change and shift in initial access methods. It's no longer, phishing is still important, but legit credentials and 
uh, ITW zero days are becoming the uh, the big initial access things that we need to be as a blue team ready to defend against and ready to have a discussion about. So with that, probably no time for questions because I think I've hit the mark over one minute, but thank you so much for having me. I have really enjoyed this talk despite not having any control over my slides and I'm really sorry if I've been controlling my slides, I'm really sorry, but very grateful to be here and uh, happy to, to catch up with any of you in Slack and LinkedIn. Thank you.